Stanford University.
Thank you.
Candidates and guests, please stand for the President's party.
I greet you with grace and peace, and I welcome you to Stanford University's 130th annual commencement. Here at Stanford, it is our tradition to begin our communal celebrations with an acknowledgement of the land on which we stand and the peoples who steward it across generations. Please now turn your attention to the screen as our students offer this acknowledgement. Stanford sits on the ancestral lands of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to Native people. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to, to Native, Native people. people. In that spirit of honor and blessing, let us be together. We gather at last, returning home to mark this moment. We confess there were times we thought this day would never come, days of struggle and strife, uncertainty and doubt, and this year more than others, grief and loss. Yet despite it all, we have made it this far by faith, and for that we are exceedingly grateful. We are grateful for our families and friends, our classmates and colleagues who accompanied us and encouraged us, who supported and loved us. We are grateful for our university service workers, for staff and faculty who, amid a pandemic, held fast to our unwavering commitment to excellence in education. And above all else, we are grateful for this community, this community right here, right now, that is Stanford, a diverse and vibrant community that has become stronger through adversity, growing ever more together, even while apart. And so may the lessons learned through challenge and change shape our lives. May we never lose sight of that which matters most. Moored by our most deeply held values, may we cultivate community, pursue knowledge, and forge justice. For our time together, has instilled in us the fervent belief and sure hope that our actions can and do transform the world. For if not us, who? If not now, when? Amen. You may be seated. Well, thank you, Dean Steinwert. Graduates, Stanford faculty and staff, former and current trustees of our university, and cherished family members and friends, I thank you for joining us on this very special day to celebrate Stanford's 130th commencement. It is my great honor to warmly welcome all of you, whether you're here at Stanford or joining us via the live stream. As you can see, our commencement ceremony looks a little different this year. And so I'd like to begin by asking you to join me in thanking everyone who has made our in-person celebration possible. In this most unusual year and in light of public health restrictions, uh, this includes the groundskeepers, ushers, event planners and crew, as well as those who are working our cameras in the live stream to make it possible for us to share this celebration with those who can't be here with us today. Thank you all. <clears throat> Graduates.
graduates, you persisted through a time of extraordinary challenge, but your years at Stanford have also been marked by incredible achievement and intellectual exploration. We're all so proud of everything you've accomplished during your time at Stanford and of all of the hard work and dedication that have brought you to today. Today, we will award 2,171 master's degrees and 1,103 doctoral degrees. These, These numbers, numbers represent the hard work of students from around the globe. 1,018 international students representing 89 countries will receive degrees today. Now, some of our international students are here with us in the stadium, but many of you are watching from your homes around the world. For those who are watching from afar today, your absence here is felt. I wish you were celebrating with us in person, but I look forward to the day when we welcome you back as Stanford alumni. <laughs> Graduates, during your time at Stanford, our faculty and staff have dedicated themselves to nurturing the potential in each of you. So I want to take um, this moment to thank them for their ongoing support and encouragement, especially during this most difficult year. <laughs> Your accomplishments are also due in part to the dedication, to the loving encouragement, and to the extraordinary support of the family members and friends who have championed each of you in the years you worked toward your Stanford degree. Some of those family members and friends are here today in the stands of our stadium. Many more are watching from afar and around the world. These include your mothers and your fathers, your siblings, your grandparents, aunts and uncles, your mentors and your peers, people who helped you get to Stanford and helped you through your years here at Stanford. And so I'd last like to ask all of our graduates to join now in one of the most cherished commencement traditions we have here at Stanford. I ask each of you to think of all those family members and friends who supported you on this very special journey. And if you're here with us in the stadium, please rise if you're able, the graduates, please rise. And whether you're here in the stadium or watching with your loved ones from afar, please turn to your family members and friends and please join me in saying these words to them. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> to the family members and friends of our Stanford graduates, I say thank you as well. And please be seated now, uh, graduates. To those family members and friends, thank you for entrusting your loved ones to our university in their time here, and thank you for all that you have done to ensure their success. To all of our graduates, in person and around the world, I'm delighted to celebrate you and everything you've accomplished at Stanford as you prepare to embark on this most exciting next stage of your journey. You're entering the world beyond Stanford during a time of historic change, the pandemic has altered our world profoundly. It's also affected each of us on a deep personal level. Some have lost loved ones over the last year. Others have missed personal milestones or celebrations. We've all lacked in-person contact with friends and peers. And while we're gradually emerging from the pandemic here in California and across the United States, I know that's not the case in many parts of the world where the pandemic continues unabated. For all those who are still suffering the effects of the pandemic, in our country and around the world, my thoughts are with you. It has been a hard year. But in the face of this hardship, our community kept going. To our graduates, I'd like to say a few words today about everything you have accomplished over the last year, 
and how you have strengthened our community even during this time of fragmentation. And then I'd like to share how I believe these experiences will have helped to prepare you as you enter the world beyond Stanford. First, you have strengthened our community by leaning on one another. Your friendships have grown stronger in the face of shared challenges. You've kept one another safe by embracing health and safety protocols like wearing masks and participating in COVID testing. And you've reinforced our community by working together to find new ways to pursue the things that matter to you. Perhaps you've connected with one another through remote live performances, online painting workshops, or virtual artistic showcases. Maybe you've worked with your team and your friends to develop new processes for lab research or found creative ways to advance shared research projects remotely. You may even have worked with friends and colleagues to contribute to Stanford's COVID-19 response. Maybe you helped develop diagnostic tests or assisted with clinical trials or vaccination drives. Or perhaps you studied how to reduce the spread of disease in incarcerated populations or worked to improve our understanding of how past pandemics exacerbated disparities and what steps can be taken to mitigate these effects. Whatever your own particular area of focus, all of you have found ways to pursue your studies and to explore your interests through a difficult time. And in working together to do so, you've also reinforced our community at a time when we were physically apart. Another way in which you've strengthened our community, even as you've navigated the pandemic, is through your response to racial injustice. In the aftermath of George Floyd's murder last year, you pressed for change in our broader society and here on our campus too. You shared your personal experiences and your ideas for how Stanford needs to change. And as we've launched initiatives aimed at advancing a more just society and improving Stanford itself, your insights have helped guide our way. To our graduates who have played a key role in this work, I'm tremendously grateful for your commitment to making our community better. Finally, at the same time as you've made our community stronger over the last year, each of you individually has also learned and grown and changed through these experiences. The pandemic upended our lives. After the year we've had, it may feel tempting to turn your back on this time, to forget about it as you move to what's next. But living through this time has also provided each of us with a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to reassess, to think about what we really value, and to shape the way we want our lives to be. For graduates, this has come at a crucial moment as you prepare for the next step in your lives and careers. You now have a rare opportunity to reassess what interests, relationships, and pursuits give you meaning and fulfillment, and to design your life based on what you truly value. For some of you, this reassessment may affirm the path you were already on. Perhaps your experiences over the last year have solidified your decision to pursue further studies in your chosen field, enter a profession, or live in a certain part of the country or the world. But for others, your experiences over the last year may have caused you to change course Perhaps the last year has shown you new ways to use your talents to make a difference in the lives of others. So as each of you prepares to move on to new jobs, further studies, or to other new adventures, I encourage you to take time to reflect with your family, loved ones, and friends. And I want you to ask yourselves, what have I learned about myself this year? What are my values? And how have they shifted in the last 15 months? What matters most to me? And how can I use this knowledge to shape the life I want to lead and to contribute to the world? As Stanford graduates, you have so many opportunities in front of you. It is up to each of you to decide what to do with everything you've worked so hard for. Graduates, I'm so proud of everything you've accomplished over your years here and of the persistence, grace, and commitment to others that you've shown over the last 15 months. I hope these experiences have helped clarify what's truly important and meaningful to you. You've gained the knowledge and the skills to pursue a life 
that conforms with your values and the strength and tenacity that have brought you through the last year will help you in that pursuit. And that brings me to today's commencement speaker, Atul Gawande. A surgeon, writer, and public health leader, Atul Gawande uses his platform to advance health system solutions that produce better care and better lives for people everywhere. Atul graduated from Stanford in 1987 with majors in biology and political science. Not only is he a Stanford alum, he's also a Stanford parent. After Stanford, he studied philosophy and politics as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford and later earned his medical degree and master's in public health from Harvard. He's a practicing endocrine surgeon at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and a professor at the Harvard Medical School and T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He has founded and chaired organizations focused on innovations in health systems, making surger, surgery safer globally, and also COVID-19 testing and vaccination services. He also served as a member of the Biden Transition COVID-19 Advisory Board. In addition to his roles in medicine and public health, Atul has been a staff writer for The New Yorker magazine since 1998. He's also written four New York Times best-selling books. He's the winner of numerous awards, including a MacArthur Fellowship, the so-called Genius Award, and the Lewis Thomas Award for writing about science. In 2010, he was included in Time Magazine's list of the 100 most influential people. This is clearly someone who sets the bar very high. But most importantly, across his many roles, Atul has been a champion for humanism in healthcare. He writes movingly about the challenges, complexities, and larger ethical issues of modern medicine, and explores how we can better approach questions of medicine and care. He's advocated for practical solutions to the challenges of modern surgery and urged doctors to connect patients, uh, connect patients over their priorities and values, not just their medical needs. He's also written about the current state of care in developing countries. In all of his work, Atul brings energy, insight, and concern for others, as well as a vision for how things can be better. His example shows what you can accomplish when you lead with humanity and values and use your voice to create real change. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Atul Gawande. Congratulations, graduates. Thank you all. Thank you, President Tessier Levine. Thank you to the faculty. And thank you to all of you students for inviting me. I can think of no greater honor than being asked back to your alma mater to speak at graduation, especially this graduation. In May, I celebrated the graduation of my own child from college, from Berkeley College of Music, not that Berkeley. And it was such a beautiful milestone. But I have to admit it was deflating to have to mark it from our family room. Hunter sat on the couch in cap and gown, watching the virtual ceremony, waiting for their name to appear after a tough year of virtual music school without ensembles, without performances. To think that a month later, just one month later, we could be here together with you is thrilling. The past pandemic year blew up all of our lives. So many suffered. The coronavirus has taken millions of people from this planet, and it made tens of millions more so sick they had to be in a hospital in order to keep breathing. Those with the least wealth and opportunity, those who couldn't retreat behind their screens, suffered most. But no one escaped loss of some kind. 
The, the disease grounded our planes. It closed our borders. It shuttered workplaces and schools. It took away our ability to come together to hear music, to break bread, to hold weddings and funerals, to simply let children play. It did this for an entire year. For much of the world, the worst is not past. In the first few months of 2021, more people died from the coronavirus pandemic than in all of 2020. We are so lucky to live in this country, which has supplied such remarkably effective vaccines and in such quantities that we're now giving away hundreds of millions of doses globally. <laughs> Vaccines reached so many people that against all expectations, we can gather here like this to cheer for you at graduation. I remember my graduation one sunlit day like this years ago. I remember the joy of processing into the stadium with my friends. I remember scanning the crowd to look for the smiling faces of my family members. And I remember the annoying question everyone asks new graduates. So what now for you? And I had an answer, more school. And your answer might be the same, or it might be a job, a trip, a move back home. But the truth was that none of us knew what was ahead for us. How, how really, how could we? Many of my classmates would have careers doing work that didn't, did not even exist in 1987, when we stood where you are sitting. For example, I had classmates who'd make their mark helping the people of a post-communist Russia and Eastern Europe and a post-apartheid South Africa, none of which was more than a fever dream back then. My tech friends would later take jobs with names that would have been incomprehensible, such as app designer, driverless car engineer, data scientist, chief information security officer, blogger, or for that matter, Peloton instructor. In medicine, friends later worked in unimagined fields like genomics, face transplantation, and mRNA vaccine production. No less fantastical, in public health, I have friends who would work to implement the country's first health reform program to seek universal coverage, signed into law by America's first black president. My classmates would also have personal life experiences that were equally unpredictable, though more familiar. They'd fall in love, they'd fall out of love, They'd navigate sickness and injury. They'd grow families, and they'd lose family members. A few died way too soon. What now is a question you will ask your whole life. Entering medical school, I had a plan. I liked plans. <laughs> I wanted to do public health research and practice medicine. So I planned to train in primary care. The specialty fit these interests, and as a bonus, it had the shortest residency program. But then my clinical rotation in surgery upended my tidy scheme. What I saw captivated me. The surrealness of opening the bodies of living people drew me in instead of pushing me away. And so did the surgeons, all of them ordinary, flawed human beings with imperfect skills incomplete knowledge, and yet the confidence to nonetheless act and to take accountability for whatever outcome resulted. 
People say in moments like this, follow your passion. But how many of you even know what that is? I didn't. I had my share of enthusiasms, but sitting where you are, I wouldn't have called any of them my passion. I had no idea which enthusiasms would endure and which would fade. Over time, however, I came to be able to tell the difference between the things that merely absorbed me, the way that TikTok videos do now, and things that energized me. Seeing the difference took a while. Coming to Stanford from rural Ohio was mind-blowing. It exposed me to a wider range of things to do and to be than I'd known. During freshman year, my roommates and I signed up at KZSU for a late night slot spinning records. A professor gave me a job in his laboratory working on a devastating retinal disease. I learned to play electric guitar. I volunteered to stuff envelopes for a presidential campaign. Many of these interests came and went. But I came to recognize when something truly energized me. The radio show, for example, was not such a case. Our slot was Tuesdays from 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. After two or three shows, the fun of our on-air repartee and championing our latest new wave heroes waned dramatically. I began sleeping in and I totally flaked out on my roommates. On the other hand, I consistently lost time in the lab. Likewise, for my late night discussions with my political science friends, I ended up taking so many policy and political theory electives that I added a second major to my biology major. I wasn't good at anything yet, but I found a few things I was willing to work at long enough to get better, and I learned to pay attention when that happened. More recently, I attended a talk by Dr. Bob Wachter, who now chairs the Department of Medicine at UCSF. Answering a question from a graduate student seeking advice, he said something that stuck with me. He said, say yes to everything before you're 40, and say no to everything after you're 40. And looking back, this was pretty much what I'd done, I'd realized. In your formative years, you don't know, you can't know what will ultimately matter to you, what will grab you by the shoulders and awaken you and stay with you. So you have to be open to trying stuff, to saying yes. As you do, pay attention to what fuels you and what doesn't. You want to pull apart the experience and figure out specifically what lifted you and what sapped you. And then you want to do all you can to organize your life to do more of the first and less of the second. With me, for example, I found I was endlessly interested in getting under the surface to understand how the systems we depend on fail. The flaws of the complex systems inside our bodies and also inside our society that cause suffering. I had experiences that revealed to me the love of getting my hands in there to tinker with the systems and figure out what was possible to fix. Knowledge was one thing, but execution was another, and I found I cared about both. In further experiences, I learned that I loved assembling the story of what happens when people try to fix systems failures, how they succeed, and how they don't. For a long time, that meant I was pulled in three directions, to surgery, public health, and journalism. Over and over, people told me to choose. These things didn't fit together, they'd say. And for a very, very long time, they were right. They didn't fit together. All I saw was that each separately added something that fed me. And eventually, each fed the other. Surgery showed me the day-to-day -day reality of illness and our inadequate health systems. Writing let me investigate the flaws and ways to address them. And public health training showed me how to design systemic solutions and deliver them at population scale. For example, to deliver a team checklist for safer surgery that's now been adopted worldwide 
and saved more people from death and disability than car accidents inflict. Or to design a structured conversation between clinicians and patients with serious illness to ensure that treatment plans incorporate people's priorities for their lives besides just surviving. Or to build mass vaccination centers and COVID testing programs to help us escape from this pandemic. Every few years, I've faced a pivotal choice that scared me. One was deciding to train in surgery instead of in internal medicine. The training was eight years instead of three years. My wife Kathleen, we met here at Okada House, was pregnant with our first child. Surgery was not a natural cultural fit for me. My mentors in public health thought the direction was baffling, but still there'd been that pull during three months on service. So I told myself that I could transfer out if it didn't work, and I said yes to surgery. Three years later, I also said yes to writing, yes, a blog on the side. <laughs> and then during a two-year research period with only light clinical duties, I said yes to a chance to write longer pieces for the New Yorker magazine. A few months after I returned to full hospital duties, a publisher offered me the chance to expand those pieces into a book. And I remember the day at the hospital that I said yes into the phone and accepted the contract. It was later when I got home that night, I had, uh, that, um, it was late when I got home that night. I had three children by then, and they were asleep upstairs. And suddenly, I was flat on my back in a panic on the living room floor. What did I just commit to doing? How in the world was I going to deliver during residency? Kathleen, my wife, had thought it was crazy too, but she reminded me that I had already demonstrated the energy to stay up an extra hour or two each night or to steal time between operations to write. So I stilled my pounding heart. I kept making time for what energized and motivated me and kept trying to remove time from what beat me down. And this meant doing things that didn't fit with my plan or the images that others had of me. But I never regretted it. I've had great luck and privilege just to have the opportunities I've had, like even trying to do surgery or to write. Simply by being in this community, you too have had choices and exposures that few others have. Most people face far tighter constraints on their life. But I've seen that even patients facing the end of life, the tightest constraint of all, have had room to assert their priorities in their lives besides just living longer, to maximize time for what lifts them up, and to try to limit what brings them down. The other half of Bob Walker's advice, however, was say no to everything after you're 40. <laughs> By that he meant that by that age, you should know enough about yourself, but what really matters to you, to focus on that. In fact, you have to say no to focus on that. As you get older, this will become your advantage. You begin to know yourself, your capabilities, your gaps, what motivates you well enough to commit to efforts that can run a long time to realize. Years, decades if necessary, you even become willing to work for goals that will not be achieved in your lifetime. I want to return to COVID for a moment. This plague forced us all to see our lives anew. Under crisis, we had to pare our lives down. We had to jettison what could be jettisoned, and we had to keep what truly mattered. We had to try living in new ways. We had to figure out how to endure. For me, dealing with the uncertainty was the hardest part. How long would this plague last? How bad would it get? What troubled me most, though, was the fact that so much of the uncertainty was human-made 
instead of virus made. The, the pandemic was, and it still is, a spreading fire. Experts actually figured out, rather quickly, how to stop it with wide testing, masks, avoiding indoor crowds, use of good ventilation, and ultimately with vaccination. But knowledge is one thing and execution is another. Those communities that came together across political lines to acknowledge the threat and fight the fire were able to stop the fire. Our nation did not come together. The fact that we could not collectively summon the commitment required that we've had key leaders who saw political opportunity in undermining that commitment has been distressing beyond words. Leaders have a choice. They can move ahead by driving division and stoking fear, or they can move ahead by binding us together and confronting our fears. The divisive path generates attention more easily and generates more immediate gratification. That means we will always have those who will take the divisive path. The fact that that path is ultimately dispiriting for people, however, while the other path raises our spirits up, gave me confidence about which eventually would prevail. That confidence has been shaken, to be sure. But we stand here together today because enough of us have come together across political lines and increasingly across countries to take up the vaccines and fight the fire. The difference between The difference between these two paths is worth, worth remembering as we each encounter that what now question in our lives, that question about what we individually will commit to next. All of us are seeking how to express our worth. And everyone does have worth equally with everyone else as human beings. We do just by being here in this world. To discover how to express that worth, you just have to keep saying yes until you found it. And if you do that, you will find it. But the better choices are not often the easiest or most enjoyable ones. The most meaningful goals are usually slow to achieve. They're also usually the ones that bind people together rather than push them apart. That feeds not only your purposes, but feeds their purposes. For it turns out that the beautiful secret of how our species is made is that we are often most energized when we help others express their worth. That truth is easy to miss behind our screens, watching the news, when separated from one another. But it is the reason why we all, all of us here, have gathered and why we hold such confidence in you. And this truth is why we believe you and your entire generation are the reason our better angels will prevail. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you so much, Atul, for those wonderful remarks. We so appreciate you being part of this celebration today. Now, Dr. Gawande has urged all of our graduates to say yes to everything, at least those who are under the age of 40. So to those of you who are under 40, I ask, what is your answer to Dr. Gawande? Is it yes or is it no? I can't, I can't hear you. What, what is, is it? it? Come on, you can do better than that, Stanford graduates. Yes. yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, thank you again, Dr. Gowande. You have a committed crowd here. <laughs> and now I'd like to invite the provost to please join me to present the candidates for degrees. Mr. President. First, I would like to mention 
that because of the unusual circumstances of the pandemic, we were not able last year to honor the recipients of the 2020 University Awards. We will honor them more fully when we convene the in-person celebration of 2020 graduates. Yes, but for, but for now, let me acknowledge the recipients. Sue Crutcher and William S. Talbot were the recipients of the Kenneth M. Cuthbertson Award for contributions to Stanford University. Harry J. Elam Jr., Liam McGregor, and Emily Polk were the recipients of the Lloyd W. Dinkelspiel Award for distinctive contributions to undergraduate education. And Samar Al Sabr, Aditya Grover, and Allison Hobbs received the Walter J. Gores Award for Excellence in Teaching. Now, there is more information about the award recipients, and it can be found on the commencement website, and the recipients of the 2021 awards will be recognized at tomorrow's ceremony. Mr. President, I now have the honor to recognize all those who have completed their requirements for master's and doctoral degrees they will be presented to you by the deans of their schools. Thank you. Will the candidates from the School of Engineering please stand if you are able? Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Master of Science, Engineer, and Doctor of Philosophy. Thank you, Dean Whittem. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am delighted to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you have been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Will the graduates from the School of Engineering please be seated? Will the candidates from the School of Law please stand if you are able? <laughs> Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Doctor of Jurisprudence, Master of the Science of Law, Doctor of the Science of Law, and Master of Laws. Thank you, Dean Martinez. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am delighted to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you have been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Will the graduates from the School of Law please be seated? Will the candidates from the Graduate School of Education please stand if you are able?
Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Master of Arts and Doctor of Philosophy. Thank you, Dean Schwartz. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am delighted to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you have been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Will the graduates from the Graduate School of Education please be seated? Will the candidates from the School of Humanities and Sciences please stand if you are able? <laughs> Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Master of Arts, Master of Liberal Arts, Master of Science, Master of Fine Arts, Doctor of Musical Arts, and Doctor of Philosophy. Thank you, Dean Satz. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am delighted to confer upon you the degrees for which you have been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Will the graduates from the School of Humanities and Sciences please be seated. Will the candidates from the School of Earth, Energy, and Environmental Sciences please stand if you are able. <laughs> Mr. President, I present you, to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Master of Arts, Master of Science, Engineer, and Doctor of Philosophy. Thank you, Dean Graham. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am delighted to confer publicly upon you, including my daughter, Ella, of whom I'm so very proud, <laughs> the degrees for which you have been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Will the graduates from the School of Earth, Energy, and Environmental Sciences please be seated? <laughs> Will the candidates from the Graduate School of Business please stand if you are able? Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Master of Arts in Business Research, Master of Science in Management, Master of Business Administration, and Doctor of Philosophy. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Levin. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I'm delighted to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you have been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Will the graduates from the School of Business please be seated? Will the candidates from the School of Medicine please stand if you're able.
Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Master of Arts, Master of Science, Doctor of Medicine, and Doctor of Philosophy. Thank you, Dean Minor. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am delighted to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you have been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Will the graduates from the School of Medicine please be seated? Well, thank you, Dean Minor, and thank you to all of our deans. Again, to our graduates, on behalf of Stanford University, congratulations to you on this very special day. You have graduated from the family of Stanford students, and you've joined the family of Stanford alumni. From this day forward, wherever you go in the world, whatever path you explore and whatever contribution you seek to make, you will remain forever cardinal and forever a part of the Stanford community. In closing, as you start a new journey as graduates of Stanford, I, will hope, I hope you will let today serve as a true commencement, a beginning, not an ending. You have persevered through an extraordinary and challenging time. Now is the moment to take what you've learned and use that knowledge to shape the life you want to lead. I urge each of you to follow your talents, your interests, and your values, to discover your own unique path, and to build a life of meaning and of purpose. Congratulations, 2021 graduates! Twenty graduates, congratulations! It's an honor to be marking this moment with you today. When I, when I finished my doctorate degree, my parents were in a different country watching at 9 p.m. My mother cheered so loudly the neighbors came over. So if you have an, your family has an impromptu celebration with the neighbors, it could be a very vocal loved one. <laughs> I was hoping to actually for the benediction today to recite two verses of the Quran, and I will follow it with the translation. Ya ayyuhan nasu qad jaatkum mawaidatum min rabbikum wa shifaun lima fi suduri wa hudaw wa rahmatun lil mu'mineen. قل بفضل الله وبرحمته فبذلك فليفرحوا هو خير مما يجمعون. O oh people, you have received advice from your Creator, a cure for what is in your hearts. 
guidance, and compassion for people of faith. Say in God's grace and mercy, let them rejoice. That is far better than whatever material wealth they can gather. This past year has been full of challenges, lessons, loss and healing, new insights, and new communal bonds. What we gained in love, compassion, friendship, and knowledge is far more valuable than any material possession. Class of 2021, you took your last test and you handed in your last assignment. The tests that are to come are tests of purpose and integrity. May you have humility when you succeed and the courage to stand up again when you fall short. You carry with you the hopes and dreams of everyone who loves you. Let that love be your strength and light and carry you through the best of times and the most difficult of times. Amen. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.